Well, good morning, little darlings. I certainly hope this video finds you well uh, and has happy, happy, happy. Um, we're going to start book three of The Tale of Despero by Kate DiCamillo. You remember that? And I certainly wish we were together because... Book the third is called Gore, the Tale of Midgery So. But if you guys were with me, those of you that have seen the movie could tell me how to actually pronounce that name. I mean, Midgery or Migri or So or Sow. I'm going to say Midgery So. And I hope that's good enough. Here we go. We're on chapter 24, a handful of cigarettes, a red tablecloth, and a hen. Hmm. Well, here we go. Again, reader, we must go backward before we can go forward. With that said, here begins a short history of the life and times of Midgery So, a girl born into this world many years before the mouse Despero and the rat Chiaroscuro, a girl born far from the castle, a girl named for her father's favorite prize-winning pig. Midgery So was six years old when her mother, holding on to Mig's hand and staring directly into Mig's eyes, died. Ma, said Mig, Ma, couldn't you stay here with me? Oh, said her mother, who is that? Who is that holding my hand? It's me, Ma, Midgery So. Ah, child, let me go. But I want you to stay here, said Mig, wiping first at her runny nose and then at her runny eyes. You want, said her mother. Yes, said Mig, I want. Ah, child, and what does it matter what you are wanting, said her mother. She squeezed Mig's hands once, twice, and then she died, leaving Mig alone with her father, who, on a market day in spring, soon after his wife's death, sold his daughter into service for a handful of cigarettes, a red tablecloth, and a hen. Papa, said Mig, when her father was walking away from her, with the hen in his arms, a cigarette in his mouth, and the red tablecloth draped across his shoulders like a cape. Go on, Meg, he said. You belong to that man now. But I won't. I don't want to, Papa, she said. I want to go with you. She took hold of the red tablecloth and tugged on it. Look, child, her father said. And who is asking you what you want? Go on now. He untangled her fingers from the cloth and turned her in the direction of the man who bought her. Mig watched her father walk away, the red tablecloth billowing out behind him. He left his daughter, and reader, as you already know, he did not come back, not even once. Can you imagine it? Can you imagine your father selling you for a tablecloth, a hen, and a handful of cigarettes? Close your eyes, please and consider it for just a moment. Done? I hope that the hair on the back of your neck stood up as you thought of Mig's fate and how it would be if it were your own. Poor Mig, what will become of her? You must, frightened though you may be, read on and see for yourself. Reader, it is your duty. Chapter 25, A Vicious Circle. Midgery So called the man who purchased her uncle as he said she must. And also, as, she, as he said she must, Mig tended uncle's sheep and cooked uncle's food and scrubbed uncle's kettle. She did all of this without a word of thanks or praise from the man himself. Another unfortunate fact of life with Uncle was that he very much liked giving Mig what he referred to as a good clout to the ear. In fairness to Uncle, 
it must be reported that he did always inquire whether or not Meg was interested in receiving the clout. Their daily exchanges went something like this. Uncle, I thought I told you to clean the kettle. Meg, I cleaned it, Uncle. I cleaned it good. Uncle, ah, it's filthy. You'll have to be punished, won't you? Meg, gore, Uncle, I cleaned the kettle. Uncle, are you saying that I'm a liar, girl? Meg, no, Uncle. Uncle, do you want a good clout to the ear then? Meg, no, thank you, Uncle, I don't. Alas, Uncle seemed to be as entirely unconcerned with what Meg wanted as her mother and father had been. The disgust clout to the ear was always delivered. Delivered, I am afraid, with a great deal of enthusiasm on Uncle's part and received with absolutely no enthusiasm at all on the part of Meg. These clouts were alarmingly frequent, and Uncle was scrupulously fair in paying attention to both the right side of Meggery's soul. So it was that after a time, the young Meg's ears came to resemble not so much ears as pieces of cauliflower stuck to either side of her head, and they became and they became about as useful to her as pieces of cauliflower. That is to say that they all but ceased their functioning as ears. Words for Meg lost their edges, and then they lost their edges altogether and became blurry, blankety things that she had a great deal of trouble making any sense out of at all. The less Meg heard, the less she understood. The less she understood, the more things she did wrong, and the more things she did wrong, the more clouts to the ear she received and the less she heard. This is what is known as a vicious circle. And Midgery So was right in the center of it, which is not, reader, where anybody would want to be. But then, as you know, what Midgery So wanted had never been much concern to anyone. Well, here we go with chapter 26. It's called Royalty. When Mig turned seven years old, there was no cake, no celebration, no singing, no present, no acknowledgement of her birthday at all, other than Mig saying, Uncle, today I am seven years old. And Uncle saying in return, Did I ask ye how old you were today? Get out of my face before I give ye a good clout to the ear. A few hours after receiving her birthday clout to the ear, Meg was out in the field with Uncle's sheep when she saw something glittering and glowing in the horizon. She thought for a moment that it was the sun, but she turned and saw that the sun was in the west where it should be, sinking to join the earth. This thing that shone so brightly was something else. Mig stood in the field and shaded her eyes with her left hand and watched the brilliant light draw closer and closer and closer until it revealed itself to be King Philip and his queen Rosemary and their daughter, the young Princess P. The royal family was surrounded by knights in shining armor and horses in shining armor, and atop each member of the royal family's head there was a golden crown and they were all the king and the queen and the princess, dressed in robes decorated with jewels and sequins that glittered and glowed and captured the light of the setting sun and reflected it back. Gore, breathed Mig. The Princess P was riding on a white horse that picked up its legs very high and set them down very daintily. The pea saw Mig standing and staring, and she raised a hand to her. Hello, the princess pea called out merrily. Hello, and she waved her hand again. Mig did not wave back. Instead, she stood and watched, open-mouthed, as the perfect, beautiful family passed her by. Papa called the princess to the king. What is wrong with the girl? She will not wave to me. 
Never mind, said the king. It is of no consequence, my dear. But I am a princess, and I waved to her. She should wave back. Mig, for her part, continued to stare. Looking at the royal family had awakened some deep and slumbering need in her. It was as if a small candle had been lit in her interior, sparked to life by the brilliance of the king and the queen and the princess. For the first time in her life, reader, Mig hoped. And hope is like love, a ridiculous, wonderful, powerful thing. Mig tried to name this strange emotion. She put a hand up to touch one of her aching ears, and she realized that the feeling she was experiencing, the hope blooming inside of her, felt exactly the opposite of a good clout. She smiled and took her hand away from her ear. She waved to the princess. Today is my birthday, Mig called out. But the king and the queen and the princess were by now too far away to hear her. Today, shouted Mig, I am seven years old. Well, let's go on to chapter 27, A Wish. That night, in the small dark hut that she shared with Uncle and the sheep, Mig tried to speak of what she had seen. Uncle, she said, eh? Hey? I saw some human stars today. How's that? I saw them all glittering and glowing, and there was a little princess wearing her own crown and riding on a little white tippy-toed horse. What are you going on about, said Uncle. I saw a king and a queen and an itty-bitty princess, shouted me. So, shouted Uncle back. I would like, said Mig shyly, I wish to be one of them princesses. Ha! laughed Uncle. Ha! An ugly dumb thing like you. You ain't even worth the enormous lot I paid for you. Don't I wish every night that I had back that good hen and that red tablecloth in place of you? He did not wait for Mig to guess the answer to this question. I do, he said. I wish it every night. That tablecloth was the color of blood. That hen could lay eggs like nobody's business. I want to be a princess, said Mig. I want to wear a crown. A crown, Uncle laughed. She wants to wear a crown. He laughed harder. He took the empty kettle and put it atop his head. Look at me, he said. I'm a king. See my crown? I'm a king, just like I always wanted to be. I'm a king because I want to be one. He danced around the hut with the kettle on his head. He laughed until he cried. And then he stopped dancing and took the kettle from his head and looked at Meg and said, Do you want a good clout to the ear for such nonsense? No, thank you, uncle, said Meg. But she got one anyway. Look here, said Uncle, after the clout had been delivered. We will hear no more talk of princesses. Besides, who ever asked you what you wanted in this world, girl? The answer to that question, reader, as you well know, was absolutely no one. Well, I think we'll do one more chapter, and then I'll see if I can figure out how to turn this thing off. Okay, so chapter 28, To the Castle. Years passed. Mig spent them scrubbing the kettle and tending the sheep and cleaning the hut and collecting innumerable, uncountable, extremely painful clouts to the ear. In the evening, spring or winter, summer or fall, Mig stood in the field as the sun set, hoping that the royal family would pass before her again. Gore, I would like to see that little princess another time, wouldn't I? And her little pony, too, with his tippy-toed feet. This hope, this wish, that she would see the princess again was lodged deep in Mig's heart. Lodged firmly right next to it was the hope that she, Midgery So, could someday become a princess herself. <clears throat> 
The first of Meg's wishes was granted in a roundabout way when King Philip outlawed soup. The king's men were sent out to deliver the crim news and to collect from the people of the kingdom of Dor their kettles, their spoons, and their bowls. Reader, you know exactly how and why this law came to pass, so you would not be as surprised as Uncle was when, one Sunday, a soldier of the king knocked on the door of the hot bat Megan uncle and the sheep shared and announced that soup was against the law. How's that? said uncle. By royal order of King Philip, repeated the soldier, I am sent here to tell you that soup has been outlawed in the kingdom of Dor. You will, by order of the king, never again consume soup nor will you think of it or talk about it. And I, as one of the king's loyal servants, am here to take from you your spoons, your kettles, and your bowls. But that can't be, said Uncle. Nevertheless, it is. What'll we eat? And what'll we eat it with? Cake, suggested the soldier, with a fork. And wouldn't that be lovely, said Uncle, if we could afford to eat cake? The soldier shrugged. I'm only doing my duty. Please hand over your spoons, your bowls, and your kettle. Uncle grabbed hold of his beard. He let go of his beard and grabbed the hair on his head. Unbelievable, he shouted. I suppose next the king will be wanting my sheep and my girl, seeing as those are the only possessions I have left. Do you own a girl, said the soldier. I do, said Uncle. A worthless one, but still, she is mine. Ah, said the, sh said the soldier. That, I am afraid, is against the law, too. No human may own another in the kingdom of Dor. But I paid for her fair and square with a good lane hen and a handful of cigarettes and a blood-red tablecloth. No matter, said the soldier. It is against the law to own another. Now you will hand over to me, if you please, your spoons, your bowls, your kettle, and your girl. Or if you choose not to hand over these things, then you will come with me to be imprisoned in the castle dungeon. Which will it be? And that is how Mijeriso came to be sitting in a wagon full of soup-related items next to a soldier of the king. Do you have parents, said the soldier? I will return you to them. Eh? A ma, shouted the soldier. Dead, said Meg. Your pa, shouted the soldier. I ain't seen him since he sold me. Right, I'll take you to the castle then. Gore, said Meg, looking around the wagon in confusion. You want me to paddle? To the castle, shouted the soldier. I'll take you to the castle. The castle where the itty-bitty princess lives? That's right. Gore, said Meg. I am to be a princess too someday. Well, that's a fine dream, said the soldier. He clucked to the horse and tapped the reins and they took off. I'm happy to be going, said Meg, putting a hand up and gently touching one of her cauliflower ears. Might just as well be happy, seeing as it doesn't make a difference to anyone but you, if you are or not, said the soldier. We will take you to the castle, and they will set you up fine. You no longer will be a slave. You will be a paid servant. Eh? said Meg. You will be a servant, shouted the soldier, not a slave. Gore, said Meg, satisfied. A servant I will be not a slave. She was 12 years old. Her mother was dead. Her father had sold her. Her uncle, who wasn't her uncle at all, had clouded her until she was almost deaf. And she wanted more than anything in the world to be a little princess wearing a golden crown and riding a high stepping white horse. Reader, do you think that it is a terrible thing to hope when there really is no reason to hope at all? Or is it, as the soldier said about happiness, something that you might just as well do, since in the end, it really makes no difference to anyone but you? Well, there you go, babies.
Ah, if I did this right, we're still going to have to see about it. But I just want to tell you, I love you. I miss you. Ah, again, I hope you're doing well. So keep calm, read on, and wash your hands, darlings.